The doubters said James Franklin doesn't win the big game. Then James Franklin goes and wins a big game. And surprisingly enough, the goalposts shift once again. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks so much for making Locked On Nittany Lions your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. My name is Zach Seiko. I'm your host of the show. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. These are my biggest takeaways from Penn State versus USC. If you got one that you want to share, let me know down in the comments. Be a part of the discussion as we will begin with just that. James Franklin winning the big game and then getting to how James Franklin outcoached Lincoln Riley. So a lot of things went well for Penn State in addition to this 33-30 to victory over USC. James Franklin wins the big game and then of course the goalposts move once again. And this wasn't just any old win for Penn State. Now, if you want to say that Penn State struggles to beat Ohio State or when Michigan was peaking, understandable. But to say that James Franklin doesn't win any big games, what is Illinois? What is USC? What is any of those other bowl games? James Franklin, is, yes, Penn State and James Franklin struggle with Ohio State. But this isn't uh, this isn't carryover into all these other types of contests. James Franklin and Penn State do win other big games outside of Ohio State, and this wasn't just any any old win for Penn State. No, Penn State overcame a twenty to six halftime deficit. In addition to that, the odds were against them in the fact that they had to fly. Okay, so. Oh, when teams travel from coast to coast, they're one and eight, one and nine. Penn State's on the wrong side uh, of this trend. Well, Penn State flies six hours across the country to play an unfamiliar opponent, a quality opponent in USC, and that and that's where I'm going to get to the point about how the goalposts uh, move a little bit there. Then they last that same team, they outlast that same team in overtime while simultaneously knocking USC out of the college football playoff. There, I, there's no way they get in with three-plus losses, even if they go on a winning streak to finish out the season. So you do all of that, fly across the country, win against a quality opponent, win a big game, a season-defining game, do it on the road, and you knock out the new one of the newest Big Ten members out of the college football playoff when that was Lincoln Riley and USC's goal. I... Penn State checked off a lot of boxes in this game. I think most importantly, though, Penn State controls its own destiny moving forward. Big Ten Championship is on the table, and it was preseason as well. It's not that Penn State could never make the Big Ten Championship or that the odds weren't necessarily in their favor. Ohio State and Oregon were going to be favored, and rightfully so. I mean, that game went down to the wire, and Ohio State is still an elite type of team. But Penn State was that third team in the Big Ten Meaning that, okay, there's two teams that get in. Well, if one of them slips up, Penn State, if they're in the right position there, could make the Big Ten Championship. That reality is more likely today than it was before that USC game. A first round bye, well, in the latest AP Top 25 poll, Penn State is number three. Does that ranking hold? We'll see. And how does the college football playoff committee rank Penn State? That's left to be seen. But this is a step in the right direction, or at least this is trending in the right direction for Penn State. A home playoff game would be legendary, it would be historic, it would be a moment to be remembered regardless of the result. Obviously, everybody would like to see, Penn State fans would like to see a Penn State victory. That's understandable. But the game, the event itself, I think Penn State, the football team, would actually like to pass on that if there's an opportunity for the first round bye. As great as a winner playoff game would be at Beaver Stadium, I know that James Franklin and that team would rather have the first round by going into the quarterfinals as a top four team. But my overall point here is that Penn State controls its own destiny. Now, Ohio State with one loss, you can really, you can really push them out of the conversation or make things a little more difficult, make it a much more uphill battle for Ohio State if you win that game. As it stands right now, Penn State's a four point underdog to Ohio State. That, that's not a 7-14 point deficit there. 
Vegas clearly believes that Penn State will make that a ball game. Don't just count out the Nittany Lions because it is Ohio State. But Ohio State is the toughest game remaining. However, if you look at that one, if you want to assume, if you want, if you want to assume that that one's a loss, and as of right now, I would, pref- I would think that Ohio State's chances are a little better as that game gets closer. We'll break it down in depth, of course. But on paper, it looks like the Buckeyes are going to win. Everything else sets up nicely for Penn State. They control their own destiny. Games against Wisconsin, Washington, Minnesota, Purdue, Maryland, all those games are very winnable. Control what you can control. Don't discount anybody. Minnesota upset USC. Washington, I think, will get better as time progresses, and Wisconsin seems to be getting things into gear despite missing some key players. Penn State matches up well with all of them at the end of the day. So they control their own destiny. They can go 11 and 1, make the playoff, and 11 and 1 gets you into a Big Ten championship game depending on how things break with the tiebreaker. Let's talk about those goalposts that move, though. Okay, so it went from this could have been a top 10 game, and then USC ultimately dropped close ones to Michigan and Minnesota. Unacceptable loss, I think, against the Golden Gophers, but still understandable to to do that travel and to play against those teams. USC didn't exactly match up ideally with them. And watching those games, that's where I said, okay, I can change my pick with confidence knowing that Penn State can beat USC and did ultimately. Where the goalposts move, once again, is that, well, it's not a big game anymore. USC is not no longer a quality opponent because they're unranked. They would have been hypothetically 26th. If the AP moves its poll to 26 teams, then USC would have been ranked. The only reason that they weren't ranked, they were the best unranked team, if you will. That was a road game. It it feels like it's just a slight at Penn State. I, I don't know how you can look at this game and say that it's not a quality victory, that it's not a season defining victory. It's going to matter to the college football playoff committee. That's not an easy environment to, to win in. And again, the 1-8 and eight or 1-9 and nine record, whatever it is, when teams travel to the opposite coast, Penn State bucked that trend. So is it a big game or not? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. I think it's a big game. Penn State's biggest struggle, the biggest giant that they can't overcome to this point, is Ohio State. And then recently, over the past three years, Michigan, when Jim Harbaugh and company were at their peak. Let's get to the point about how James Franklin and Andy Kotelnicki and Tom Allen, of course, because they're the coordinators, outcoached Lincoln Riley and former Penn State football player DeAnton Lynn at that defensive coordinator spot for the Trojans. Andy Kotelnicki, Tom Allen, James Franklin made all the necessary adjustments here when it came to the second half. So everybody highlights how Tom Allen makes second half adjustments. And the defense did. The defense held USC to 10 points for the remainder of the game. But it was Penn State offense that had only scored six, six points in the first half. That's really uncharacteristic. And Andy Kotelnicki made the necessary changes too. So they outscored USC after the first half, 27 to 10. Going back to my point about how they outlasted USC on the road after that six hour plane trip. Those explosive plays went away. USC had these big explosive running plays, which was 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 really glaring for Penn State, and that went away. USC could only get small chunk plays. They weren't getting these big explosive plays of 20, 25 plus yards, and then the big ones for touchdowns. Penn State's defense held USC to field goals after big turnovers. Again, advantage Tom Allen. And Kotal Nicky called a near-perfect game after the first half. Penn State might be a second half team well they are they are a second half team so it's kind of anticipated that they're going to perform better in the second half but it was the fact that they continued to make necessary adjustments after turnovers after usc looks like it has all the momentum and penn state still continued to chip away at that deficit and remain in the game and go toe-to-toe with usc in a shootout that team a season ago would not be able to do that also look at the penalties penalties were held in check Penn State's had a huge problem with penalties, not in a game that mattered where it mattered the most, and USC would have capitalized on that. Penn State also outgained USC by 100 yards, roughly 100 yards there. They put up over 500 yards of total offense. 
in a game where six points were only scored in the first half. They won the time of the possession time of possession battle too, given that they lost the turnover battle. Okay, so you're going to look at that and say, yeah, that Penn State surrendered three turnovers. They lost the turnover battle, but somehow still won the time of possession battle. Andy Konelnicki, Tom Allen, for what it's worth, I know they gave up 30 points. I know it was a slow start, but both sides of the football called a very close to perfect game on each side for Allen and Kotelnicki. They made the necessary adjustments and they outcoached Lincoln Riley and DeAnton Lynn at the end of the day. And that was the difference for Penn State to win against USC on the road like that. And there's even better news on the way. So the bye week is this week. And Penn State is going to enjoy this victory, and fans should enjoy this victory over USC as Penn State's now 6-0. But there's even better news from this. Penn State's offense and defense are only going to get better. Yes, it's a fact. We'll talk about that on the other side of this break. And today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Now, LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you cannot find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but they might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn understands that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not necessarily have the time to devote to hiring. And that's why LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier and more intuitive. And it's why 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Be one of them. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Now, if you thought Penn State's offense and defense had met its peak, like, hey, this is the best version that we're going to see. They're going to face tougher football teams. But allow me to say this, that the best is yet to come for both Andy Konelnicki's offense and Tom Allen's defense. I've mentioned this before. If you're a new listener or a new viewer, welcome to the show. But I've talked about how there needs to be a grace period. There needs to be an understanding that with a brand new system, it's going to take time to get adjusted. I know they're six games in and they're at the second bye week here, but you still need to allow them the time. So the fact that Penn State is already getting these kinds of results on both offense and defense, when you look at yards per play, Penn State's offense and defense have been in the top 10 for both yards per play offensively and yards per play allowed defensively. That's extremely impressive. Yes, you have the talent and that should be expected, but it's the fact that there was no lag. There, Yes, there were some mistakes here and there that Penn State's offense and defense is going to have to clean up. And that's my point, is that these are some small, subtle mistakes that are going to continue to be corrected as comfortability sets in. Chemistry, let me explain. This bye week is the turning point. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of angles to approach this from. The bye week is the turning point because now there's that comfortability. Now that the players know the system, now that they've worked through the system, and now they have the results too, so there's a confidence being built up here. They can work on the little things now uh, in terms of what? Timing. I'll talk about chemistry in just a moment and highlight specifically a Drew Aller and Julian Fleming connection. But that's my point is that the best is still yet to come for both groups because they're a new offense and a new defense. Players have to learn a new playbook. They have to be able to run it successfully against opponents. And then they go back and review and say, okay, what did we do well? What can we do better? And that just takes time. That's why I'm kind of, that's why I'm higher on Washington than most because Washington's a completely new team, but they're uber talented. And I hope they don't, they, I hope they don't peak too much against Penn State. But no, that would be a really quality victory if Washington uh, puts it together by that, by that game for the, for the actual whiteout. Back to Penn State's offense and defense though, they have the confidence. They have full confidence. They have total buy-in. No one was ever doubting the ability of either coach or playbook. I'm not, that's not what I'm trying to say, but now every player has belief fully in the respective system 
and knows how to run it and how they fit within that system. They are playing complementary football too. A season ago, it, it was rough. It was really rough to watch that. Imagine, and, and it's not to take away from Tom Allen's uh, current group because Manny Diaz in 2023 did a lot of things well, top five defense in a lot of different categories, number one in different categories too. And if the offense had bailed out the defense a couple more times, it's, it's crazy to think that Manny Diaz's defense a season ago could have been even better. Offense plays into the defense, defense plays into the offense. It's a yin and yang. That complimentary football that James Franklin talks about the defense sets up the offense with turnover, short field, same thing. The offense comes out and runs a 12, 15 play drive. Penn State's offense could never do that. They could never give the defense a break. And the defense was still as stout as it was for being on the field as constantly as it was. You didn't see that at all last season. Now you're seeing it where Andy Kotelnicki's group can go 0-100 to 100 in a matter of moments. They can score in 20 seconds like they did against West Virginia. They can lead those 10, 12, 15 play drives that chew tons of clock and just, hey, just can the defense get a breather here? Can you put together a sustainable drive and march down the field and punch it into the end zone or at least get very close because that's what happened against USC a little more often than not to my liking, but they were able to march down the field and not turn the ball over in those situations. I know there were other turnovers. However, that's this offensive group compared to last year is miles ahead. Then the chemistry. The chemistry is going to continue to develop. Drew Aller and Julian Fleming specifically, you see it happen in real time in the game. First half, Aller and Fleming not on the same page. Timing, option routes where Fleming thinks he's going one way or making a sharper cut. Drew Aller thinks that he's going to stop his route and sit in the zone. It's those little things. It's those miscommunications that you need to work those out and figure them out in game. You can only do so much in practice. You have to do it when the other team is trying to make sure that you can't run it successfully. Drew, Drew Aller and Julian Fleming could prove to be a worthwhile connection down the stretch of the season now that they figured it out. Because look at that. In the fourth quarter of this game where they make not one but two plays where it's like, they had all of these issues connecting with one another in previous games. You saw it against UCLA. You saw it other times that, man, they're just not on the same page. What's going on? Well, they haven't played a lot of football together to figure it out. And then in real time against USC in crunch time, when it mattered most, they connected not once, but twice. The chemistry of Abdul Carter moving from linebacker to defensive end, that changes the complexity of a defense. And now that Abdul Carter is getting used to playing defensive end, now that the team is getting used to Abdul Carter playing at defensive end and in this hybrid role when they can really rush after the quarterback, Abdul Carter has a unique role past just being a, an edge defender, a defensive end, putting his hand in the dirt. Ab that's what I mean. The chemistry will continue to build and get better for the defense. Tom Allen will find more creative ways to get Abdul Carter involved. And then the young backups, a Dejon Lane, a Luke Reynolds, a Cooper Cousins, a, a Dakari Nelson, any of those guys. You see a Zion Tracy have a really impactful performance against USC. I could list a bunch of different players that have had reserve roles that will continue to expand, but it's that depth that's going to get better. So better days, the best days for Penn State football are going to be perfectly timed up because they need to peak against Ohio State. They didn't need to peak against USC, but this confidence, this momentum they have going into the bye week can now build. Better days are ahead for the offense and the defense and players with tons of potential are waiting to be unlocked and can be serious contributors down the stretch. And that's only going to happen as time goes on. Offense and defense have not hit their peak yet, and that's a good thing, especially since Ohio State looms in three weeks. Offense and defense are only going to get better. I stand by that. Now let's talk about Drew Aller and Tyler Warren specifically because they are the two of the MVPs, including Ryan Barker, but I want to talk specifically about Aller and Warren more so. Aller, 30 of 43, 391 passing yards, 32 rushing yards on four attempts, so over 400 yards total. Two touchdowns to three interceptions. I don't even know that I count that Hail Mary one, so but it is a turnover there, but two costly interceptions, if you will. But I look at this. 70% completion percentage, nearly 400 yards through the air for Aller, and again, in total, had over 400 yards with that 32, with those 32 yards on the ground. What impressed me the most, 
is when you look at those three interceptions, it was Drew's ability to not let those turnovers affect him because a season ago, a year ago, completely different story. I don't know that he rebounds from that. You see that against Ohio State. That Ohio State game, Drew Aller did not have uh, one of his worst performances. He'll tell you that for his Penn State career. And these mistakes show up against USC when this is a this is a turning point for the team. You can carry some momentum here. Be six and zero. Oh. Get that. Put that. Put those doubters. Quiet those doubters about how that Penn State doesn't win the big game. And then you move the goalposts again, right? As we talked about. But I saw short term memory. I saw confidence. I saw somebody that turned into a veteran. And everyone says that Drew Aller grew up this day, grew up in this game at against USC and became a different quarterback. No, Drew Aller became a different quarterback in the offseason. This was already here. If Drew Aller, Drew Aller didn't just become this in the middle of the game against the Trojans. No, he was like this already going into the season. You saw it against West Virginia. You've seen him put together other nice performances. Now, granted, I've been critical at times saying, like, hey, you know, being questionable with his decision making. But at the end of the day, Drew Aller has played elite football overall. And it's the fact that he did not let these turnovers bother him. And then Drew Aller has never been in this situation. Really, you can't say that even when you look at Ohio State and Michigan from a season ago. Aller has never been in a situation to actually run a comeback drive or a go ahead drive. He's never been in that situation. Drew led his first true comeback drive to tie the ball game and then they win it in overtime and that took and that wasn't just them handing the football off and marching down the field little by little by little no backs against the wall penn state gambled not once but twice on fourth downs where i said hey look why aren't you punting it Put the defense back out there. No, they said, we're going to trust in our offense. We don't think USC's defense can even stop us on fourth down. And they converted on fourth down multiple times. And what Drew Aller was doing, again, it wasn't these little dink and dunk passes, design screens, a little bit of uh, not, not as much trickery. You didn't. That was all in the first three quarters. That drive was truly Drew Aller being stone cold, leading that team down the field and then going through his progressions and ultimately finding a Nicholas Singleton. But those fourth down plays especially to fend off a sack and find the wide open receiver not once but twice in Julian Fleming a player that you have not been in sync with all season and you do it multiple times that was Aller, Aller's signature game that was Aller's signature moment and he looked every bit of the quarterback that most of us see him as there's the doubters that say you yeah, know fluke game fluke performance no this was the performance that confirmed, I call it bias if you want, but confirms my analysis of Drew Aller and the quarterback that he actually is. Now let's go to Tyler Warren briefly before we talk about something a little controversial in the final segment. Tyler Warren, 17 receptions, nearly broke the receiving yard held by the receiving yard single game record by Jahan Dotson at 242. Warren had 224, one touchdown. Also, don't forget about nine passing yards and four rushing yards as well. Best tight end in college football, most versatile tight end, most complete tight end, doesn't even begin to describe Tyler Warren anymore. In a game against USC like this, it, it's, not up, it's not up for debate anymore that Tyler Warren is the best tight end in college football. We got to talk about something different. Where does he rank all time? Where does he rank right now as... This goes beyond just, oh, he's he's a quality tight end and should be in line to win the John Mackey Award and be and be selected high in next year's NFL draft. No, Warren might be more versatile than Travis Hunter. Everyone's at other college football fan, Penn State fans might say, you know what, Zach, that's a good point. Other college football fans are going to say I'm crazy. Let me know in the comments. But that's the conversation. I don't think that's an overreaction to this point anymore. I know what Hunter does as a two-way player playing receiver and cornerback. I get that. But find me another player in the country, including Travis Hunter, that is snapping the football after doing a bunch of motion shifts, snapping the football as the player on the line of scrimmage, and then running downfield on a streak, beating the zone coverage, and winning a jump ball, going up and hauling in a jump ball, and securing a touchdown. Find me another player that can do that. And USC had no answer for him. You would think that DeAnton Lynn would make an adjustment and say, you know what, after 8 to 10 catches, this Tyler Warren guy is really, he's really causing some headaches for us. You think they would scheme for him. 
And they couldn't. They could not scheme for him. So after that, you know, uh, he's at a dozen. You think it's going to stop? No. Andy Kotelnicki and Tyler Warren were so in sync against USC that the Trojans and Lynn had no answer for it whatsoever. I will also add this. I've said it. I don't know that Warren is going to be able to match this type of game for a little bit. And that's not because he can't. But Wisconsin... Ohio State are definitely not going to let this go unnoticed. They will bracket Warren, so that means maybe dropping someone in underneath, having a safety over the top, basically double covering him a majority of the time. And that will force Penn State to go to its other receivers, but Penn State has other options as we've seen. Amari Evans, when they leave him in one-on-one, -on -one, deep over the top, okay. Good luck. So you have Tyler Warren that occupies the short, intermediate, and deep routes. He can do he can do all three levels, but Amari Evans can beat you over the top. Trey Wallace, relatively quiet since West Virginia, but that's because they haven't needed him to have that kind of game. And then Liam Clifford now into the fold. And if they can get Caden Saunders back, too, from injury, and Julian Fleming, once he and Drew get the timing figured out, Penn State has a plethora of options. Oh, and remember who caught the go-ahead, or not the go-ahead, the game-tying touchdown? Nicholas Singleton. So all of those receivers that I named, plus Katron Allen, Nicholas Singleton, and frankly, Quentin Martin out of the backfield, if they really needed him to, they have a lot of guys that can catch passes from Drew Aller in this system. So go ahead, Wisconsin. Go ahead, Ohio State. Bracket Tyler Warren. Double, triple cover him. Do whatever you want to stop him. You're only going to open up Drew's other options in the receiving game. And Andy Kotelnicki is a big, big part of this. The scheme, coordinators matter. That's what I've been talking about lately, and, and it's proving to be so now with the results. Andy Kotelnicki might be coaching his way out of Happy Valley, and would he leave after one season? I'll tell you the odds of that coming up after the break. And today's show is also brought to you by Game Time. You get to download the Game Time app because buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. Game Time has introduced a new feature called Game Time Picks, and that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier than before. Game Time Picks filters out all of the flops, so it's only going to show you incredible deals on incredible seats, and then you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands and thousands of tickets. Game Time already has everything sorted for you. So let's look at Penn State tickets for some of the upcoming games. They're on a bye week leading up to this weekend, but they are getting ready to play on the road at Wisconsin. If you're in the Wisconsin area or traveling for that game, Game Time's already got the best deal sorted for you. I have it pulled up right on my screen here. All in pricing, so no surprise fees to check out. You can get two tickets for a super deal in Section V, Row 60, 136 a piece. If you're looking for the lowest price on tickets for Penn State versus Wisconsin, section LL row seven, lowest price right now on game time, $96 a piece for upper deck sideline. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use promo code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. That promo code is locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. The question that's beginning to be asked a little more frequently than I'd like it to be, will Andy Kotelnicki leave Penn State after one season? And if I'm being honest, it is looking more likely game after game after game. Because I, I get it, I understand, looking good against MAC teams is, is one thing. But when you have these coaching performances against West Virginia on the road, a top 20 team against Illinois where it's not your best day, but you still have a, a convincing performance down the stretch and the way that you call plays and you win by 14 points against a ranked team, albeit at home, but two touchdowns is still pretty convincing. And then to have this masterclass against USC on the road like this, to be able to go into a shootout with them, Penn State's offense couldn't do that a season ago. So now people around college football are really taking notice, but the the understanding was that Kotal Nicky would eventually become a head coach. Maybe it would take two or three seasons at Penn State, that clock's beginning to accelerate. As the results speak for themselves here, Kotal Nicky has already had all the makings of a head coach, but now it's more apparent. This offense may be more experienced, but relatively the same group, aside from Keandre Lambert-Smith switching out with a Julian Fleming. 
The offense, Drew Aller, Nicholas Singleton, Catron Allen. You lose three starters on the offensive line that were key contributors a season ago. This is a brand new offensive line, and look what Andy Konelnicki is doing. He comes in right away with the same group relatively that what Mike Yursich had, and the results are completely different. They're so much significantly better. Kotelnicki has set Aller on the right path. So I'm trying to I'm trying to clarify, okay, so that's good. But what does this actually tangibly look like? What are people noticing about Kotelnicki's system? It's the fact that he comes in, inherits the same group that Mike Yersich had, and the results are completely better. They're significantly better. And then Drew Aller that, okay, he has a lot of intangibles that NFL scouts would like, general managers would like. Do we really want to take a chance on Drew Aller? And Kodal Nicky has now set Aller on the right path. That is massive. With quarterback being the most important position in football, athletic directors will love that. Now, it's not a guarantee one way or the other that Andy Kodal Nicky is going to leave. Let me put it into perspective, though. If Kodal Nicky gets offered by a program, has a situation line up for him that benefits him, he's not going to take a job just to take a job. It needs to be an ideal situation that opens up Power 4 program, strong support system. You don't want to go into a system where you are set up to fail. James Franklin kind of talked about that, alluded to that with, with Manny Diaz becoming a, a head coach once again. Don't go to a school where you're almost set up to fail. That's great that you're going to get a pay raise, but are you going to succeed in three, four, five years if you need to rebuild that program? Colonel Nicky's not going to just take any old job, but if it's a Power 4 program that's with the times of college athletics, whether you agree or disagree, if they are playing the right game when it comes to NIL, the transfer portal gives them all the necessary support. In an area that he's comfortable in, I expect him to leave. And can you blame him? Can you really blame him? He's making $1.5 million at Penn State. He'll get some raises here and there over the four years of his contract. As a head coach, he will have complete control and make somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six million dollars with the right school. I mean, that's a huge pay raise. If you're Andy Kotelnicki, how do you not, how do you pass that up if it's the right situation? My only concern is I wish you had a Kotelnicki disciple ready to step in because his, his offense is so entertaining. Like there, there's not an Andy Kotelnicki Jr. There's not a second in command to Andy Kotelnicki. This is all his doing. He doesn't have a team. He doesn't have a group of people that are, yeah, I mean, the staff around him, of course, but you get my, there, there's not another protege of Andy Kotelnicki's that is waiting at Penn State. Maybe that's Danny O'Brien with the time that they're going to be spending together and O'Brien can pick up some things that, that ultimately allow him to take over. Over. I don't know what the prospects look like at offensive coordinator, and I don't even want to begin to, uh, to speculate. However, the day before USC, this, this conversation really didn't have a lot of steam. Now that Penn State beat USC 33-30, to this conversation, this discussion is absolutely going to generate a lot more buzz in this case, especially with Kotal Nicky being the leading candidate for the Broyles Award, being the top coordinator. The results speak for themselves, and Kotal Nicky has succeeded everywhere he has been. Wisconsin Whitewater, Buffalo, Kansas, now in the Big Ten, one of the best conferences and proving to be the best conference currently compared to the SEC with, hey, look at the rankings, Oregon, Penn State, Ohio State, uh, Texas is at the top, but that's a lot of Big Ten teams that are in the top five there as well. Penn State's just the latest stop for Kotal Nicky. Maybe Penn State can do its best to retain him, make a counter offer. I, I highly doubt it if the right school comes in, gives him complete control, the raise that he definitely deserves. It's going to be tough for Andy Kotelnicki to pass that up if the right school comes calling. That's going to do it for this edition of Locked On Nittany Lines. I appreciate each and every one of you for checking out this episode. Please leave a like on it, share it with friends and family. More importantly, be a part of the discussion down in the comments section. Let me know your thoughts on any of these takeaways, including your biggest takeaways from Penn State versus USC. Enjoy the bye week, but we're going to have more analysis about this game and how it sets Penn State, Penn State up for the future of its schedule. And for all the latest around your favorite Penn State sports teams, keep it right here on Locked On Nittany Lions.